in case you confused it with Valencia, Pennsylvania. Have you ever in your life seen a KB toy store this huge? This is a Costco turned into a KB toys for the sake of filming. You'll be shocked to hear I'm no safe expert, but surely the owners of this safe would be fully aware that the easiest point of ingress would be via the toy shop next door. I mean, why even bother with your own security system if you don't do anything about this obvious vulnerability? And if there's not enough money in the safe to justify any additional security expenditure, it's probably not worth Rusty's time stealing it. Rusty doesn't have his phone on silent during the safe heist. Isn't the first rule of safe heist to never talk when you're safe heisting? Gotta go. Walking out on your heist mates mid-job. Oh, he's in critical condition, but he's still alive. You know, if he doesn't- Stand there? Yeah, he's been there an hour. Stan will tell us what's going on. Here's your early reminder that Linus is the butt of all jokes, just in case you were worried about any kind of character growth since the first movie. Myocardial infarction. None of these dudes are his next of kin. It's a neat shot, but hospitals are more strict than this. God damn, this trend of starting a movie, going for less than five or ten minutes, and then jumping back in time to start the actual movie. It was neat the first time or two, but now that literally every other movie does it, it's kind of annoying. Hugging Al Pacino's character before you have a firm grasp on whether or not he's playing the devil. And there's a code amongst guys that shook Sinatra's hand. <laughs> what a stupid code. Sinatra was an asshole. I hope a substantial part of the aforementioned code is to immediately get tested for STDs. What are you gonna do, throw me off the roof? No, well, I don't want to. This fool falls for the idea that they could toss him off the roof and not be tied to the murder because he is scared and stupid. Also, I realize these movies are closer to Fast and Furious than Heat when it comes to heist reality, but this threatening to toss a man off a building to get him to sign over his share of a new casino is pretty goddamn unbelievable. This is like Dom saying, family's everything, and then sipping a Corona and pointing his fist to the ground and taking off flying into the air like Neo. While Ruben has a stroke after Pacino piled on with the chip, I have to wonder, is this attempted murder? Even though Banks stepped over the line, we have to do what's best for Ruben, which means we offer Bank of Billy Martin. I see we're continuing with the using insider terms to make these guys sound clever, but ultimately could mean anything and at the same time do nothing to help the audience understand what the f is going on cliche. Yes, three movies constitute a cliche. Fine, I'll work on the wording. Also, the villain's name is Bank. <clears throat> the villain's name is Bank. No, that's the rules for someone who understands the rules, which Bank don't because he already broke them. I think it's more accurate to say the bank doesn't respect the rules. I don't think his breaking them is a result of ignorance. Then again, I could be totally misunderstanding what Basher is getting at through that persistently terrible accent he's still attempting. Damn it, Cheetle. It's been six years. You couldn't take one class. Also, is Ocean's insistence on trying this the right way supposed to make us feel better about rooting for him and the gang now that they've been forced into the shadier illegal route? Since this movie isn't called Banks 13, I'm pretty sure we already know who to root for. And since we don't have access to the heist planner's playbook, we'd have been none the wiser that the Billy Dean King protocol or whatever hadn't been respected. People who bet on me to lose, lose, and they lose big. You bet on a bet. If you lose, you lose a bet. I slice like a goddamn hammer. I have a lot of questions about this line. First, has this guy ever even seen a hammer? Second, has this guy ever even seen a hammer? Third, and not least, has this guy ever even seen a hammer? For now, we figured, figured we'd talk to you first. You want to? It's all yours. Where should we start? With the hotel. The script for this movie originally came in at three hours, but Soderbergh managed to save 60 minutes by telling these two to talk over the end of each other's sentences, pitching it as edgy. Ah, I see Bank is building Stark Tower in Las Vegas. Bank's right-hand man is a woman. Why not just call her a right hand and save syllables and the casual misogyny? Talking about your super secret million dollar heist plan in front of the waiter. We came up with a way to piggyback his system in between firewall checks. At this point, I've seen Brad Pitt eating in movies so much that I'm beginning to find it difficult to understand him when his mouth isn't filled with food. And that's it's not acceptable, people. Now this polymer reacts to ultrasonic pulses. <laughs> Okay, the Oceans movies rival Star Trek The Next Generation for techno babble abilities. Movie acts like it's easy to just break into the dice making industry and get all the way up to guy who can make dice on his own without supervision and is therefore able to make weighted dice unnoticed in six f***ing months. Also, these brothers, Ben's brother and James's son, have always been among the weakest parts of these movies. They are supposed to be comic relief, but the only thing they relieve me of is my patience. So you jammed on blackjack. So if blackjack is not your problem, it must be slots. So if that's not the problem, it must be roulette. Believe me, I would love to go up against Greco and crush him, but it can't be beat. In the name of Sinatra's spectral slippers, it has taken 10 minutes of screen time and what looks like an entire day of movie time to get to this point. I know Roman asked for the whole story, but guys, could you not have led with the thing you brought him here to help you with instead of playing this infuriating guessing game? Especially since you're paying him at least 100 grand a day. And even more especially because he is immediately able to tell you that he can't be of any help. God damn it, these motherfuckers have turned burying the lead into a f***ing Olympic sport. What exactly do you want us to do? Raise those skirts up about three inches. You got some Roger Ailes in my movie. Can't be hacked. 
and it can't be beat. This is the hacker version of character says they aren't going to do a thing before immediately deciding to do said thing. It gathers biofeedback, players' heart rates, body temperatures. That sounds like a massive privacy violation. My heart rate is the business of me and the bacon cheeseburger that caused it. Enjoy your lawsuits. The data is analyzed in real time in a field of excellence. Couldn't we just shut it off, you know, cut the wire? That could work. Better still, you could just kick the plug out of the socket. Roman would be Greco at CinemaSense. Short of walking into that room with a bloody magnetron around your neck. Foreshadowing by Izzard. For shizarding? There's no if. It cannot be shut off. I mean, you'd need a real natural disaster, an actual act of God. So what you're saying is it can, in fact, be shut off. If we could, how long would it take to reboot? Because it's so sophisticated? Three and a half minutes. Might be enough. Oh, something tells me that will somehow end up being exactly enough time. <sighs> Probably about 6 p.m., so you won't wake all the neighbors. Roman feels the need to spell out the only piece of information that this fancy graphic has decided to share with us. There's people inside, it'll feel like an airplane. That should knock out the Greco, and that's your exit strategy. Not to belabor the point, but the problem with all three of these movies is that the audience is always shown in great detail obstacles that are pitched as game-breakingly, heist-endingly insurmountable. This is always going to disappoint and ring hollow when the solution is invariably arrived at in less time than it took to describe the problem itself. Taking a thing from someone you think is a quack and putting it on your counter behind your desk like a f***ing moron. Look at all the empty space here! And the elevators in this building absolutely have to operate like the St. Louis Arch elevators, right? Over and up, over and up, over and up. There is no straight f***ing line from the lobby up any of these completely impractical hotel room spires. This is honestly the stupidest building I've ever seen. Also, it wouldn't be an Ocean's film if it didn't have copious amounts of high-altitude Vegas porn. And it wouldn't be an Ocean's Sins video if we didn't sin the snot out of it. I say, what do I look like? A pancake eater? Mm. So you just left it there on the floor? Right on the floor. I'm sure there's a more succinct way of saying this, but joining a scene halfway through a story just in time to hear the ridiculous climax, but too late to hear the beginning in the hope that said bizarre climax will be entertaining enough that you don't need to bother writing the first half of said story is really f***ing lazy. You see how Pitt and Clooney are spreading biohazards in this hotel room but protecting themselves from getting it with goggles and masks? If the five diamond inspection is supposed to be a mystery guest situation, then why would the f***ing report book be labeled with five diamond branding? Yes, I know the 13 goats of Ocean Dew want to make it as obvious as possible that Saul is the inspector but we find out later that the real inspector has a book just like this, too. The gentleman in the trilby, sir. The what? The Dr. Doolittle hat. Why didn't you just say that? Why the f*** would Bank be more familiar with a pop culture reference like Dr. Doolittle as opposed to the word trilby? And what is this supposed to tell us about his character? That he never learned the name of that thing that Sinatra always wore on his head? She stood here all f***ing day waiting for this one f***ing guy so she could step in and check him in herself, which is ludicrous. She obviously ate lunch and peed a couple times today, and how do they ensure he ends up in the room they doctored? If they already booked the specific room they want him in under his name, then why do they need a lookout here waiting to check him in? Hello, Kensington chap here. What is it with these films and terrible British accents? Yes, it's been 250 odd years, but I'm sure they're not beyond invading us again if we keep pissing them off. Prefiero morir de pie. To me, this is the most confusing subplot of the entire movie. And that, in and of itself, is an impressive feat. Why does Virgil suddenly get the desire to lead a revolution? We know it's not part of the plan because later in the movie, the worker strike creates an actual problem for the rest of the crew when they come to need the loaded dice. Has Virgil forgotten the stakes? Has his yearning for workers' rights overruled his hunger for revenge? Tell me! I'm sure a five-diamond contender like the bank has a plethora of restaurants to choose from. So how did Rusty know that the inspector was going to this exact want? He must have known ahead of time in order to bribe this maitre d' and make sure he knows to send the inspector to the Cantonese restaurant. Also, why wouldn't the maitre d' insist on the bribe money up front from this sketchy ass dude he's never seen before? It's not enough to shower his room with disease particles, you also have to infect his food? Is this poor bastard the most unfairly put upon character in film history? He sees bed bugs and runs into the bathroom instead of running out of the suite altogether. The factory in Mexico is offline. Offline? You don't think that? Yeah, I do. Wait, you guys knew this was a possibility? And you sent him anyway? How did a penchant for revolution even come up in conversation in the first place? Is it really a smart idea for the faux inspector, briber of maitre d's, the undercover card shuffler, the casino game, expo plant, and THE Danny Ocean who bank knows is up to something to be hanging out together and ordering room service in the hotel they're heisting. In fact, I don't see a reason for half these people to be here in the first place, especially while poor Basher is sweating his British bollocks off in the channel digger. Where's that put us? Cattled. It's not an Ocean's movie if Basher doesn't have some surprising hurdle that he describes using super British phrasing no Americans understand. It's hilarious. Is there a way to do it without the drill? If there were, what would be the point of this conversation? Think, boiler room, think! Well, is there a way for us to raise money? I've got everything I have in this already. So do I. 
Me too. We all do. Then the question still stands. Linus didn't ask if anyone had the money. He asked if there was a way for them to raise the money. Like, oh, I don't know. Asking their arch nemesis to loan them the cash in exchange for something they'll say is absolutely 100% impossible to do, but of course we'll end up being able to do anyway, or something. That's your idea? I know it's not a great idea. The terrible idea in question is to strong-arm Andy Garcia into this movie by asking him for a loan to pay for the drill. Something which is so abhorrent a notion that it takes all of 20 seconds for Danny and Russie to agree to. As long as we have one idea, we shouldn't give up. Family Guy. That monstrosity that bank calls a hotel casts a shadow over my pool. Break him. As far as character motivations go, this one's pretty weak, but still makes more sense than his two and a half minutes of screen time in Passengers. Anything thicker than five inches, we got a problem. My college girlfriend said this. I'm so sorry to have been a little tardy, mister. And for the hundredth time in this trilogy alone, we have a being late for no apparent reason cliche. Up you go. What was you? What do you mean you're not going? We gotta go. Hard what? Too fast. This asshole lets the team spend its last 10 million, execute a bullshit high roller backstory, and even watches them take the f***ing ceiling tile down before he tells them he's not going to go through with his part of the plan. Surely he knew what his role entailed. I feel like the movie only has Yen object so they can get him to do this. They built them a lot smaller back then. My college girl. Did you TiVo this? I was reading the paper. With the sound at full volume? Honestly, I can barely hear it. That is nowhere near full volume. Are they really gonna build their new home? Yeah, for the whole family. Also, it seems like Soderbergh is at the point in his career when no one is telling him it's okay to leave shit on the cutting room floor because this scene does absolutely nothing for the story. Yes, we come back to Benedict appearing on the show in the finale, but that's about it. The rest of this scene is over a minute of them crying as they watch Oprah. This guy was literally the sushi chef that poisoned David Paymer, which was like yesterday, but he still then went down to Mexico to join the labor protests? Why not make it Ocean's 14 and hire one more guy to be the sushi dude and let those two go to Mexico together in the first place? Look, if you can sneak Rusty in here in uniform, do you really need a phone call ruse to get some dude away from his computer? How much are we talking about? 36,000. I am so glad this huge revolution-sized obstacle to the entire heist success came down to $36,000. Lonesome Jim cared so much. Why the f couldn't he have coughed up the 36 k I get that the movie would be pretty dull if every aspect of the plan went off without a hitch, but once again, this just boils down to something that essentially wasn't a problem at all. Tunica, Mississippi. Benedict doesn't realize that he is, in fact, a casino owner, and therefore probably doesn't need to rehearse for his part of casino owner at Expo. I was born ready. George Clooney's expression whilst watching the final cut of this movie somehow makes it into this scene. It's electrifying. It's exciting. Ma, please give you a demonstration of casino dominoes. Oh my god, dude. Vegas was wild. We got totally wasted and played f***ing dominoes. Since it's Vegas, I feel justified in asking about the odds that Bank would even walk nearby this set-up Bernie Mac casino game sales booth. Let alone the odds that he would actually engage with Mac and hear about the game. Let alone the odds that he would turn the game down dismissively, setting up the Andy Garcia fake-out. Let alone that he would actually buy this Andy Garcia fake-out. I mean, god damn. Now, Mr. Bank has three minutes. You've got one. Go. You gotta be on the same page, because if all eyes in Vegas are gonna be on me, it's gotta be perfect. Yeah, yeah, time is money, but if you want this to be perfect, do you maybe want to give them more than 60 seconds of your goddamn day? I love that Bank is Gaga for a gold phone whose base model was obsolete within six months. I get that it looks cool, but when you give me three to four shots on screen together where each has a different important thing going on, how the f*** am I even supposed to know what to look at? If the plan requires these two idiots to full sprint behind the scenes, your plan sucks. Nothing should ever hinge on these two f***wads. They had to sprint here, but apparently have all the time in the world to spend talking to the guests and doing their usual Casey and Scott Anoyathon routine. Acting like aphrodisiacs are real. Also, using an aphrodisiac. That sh** is manipulative and takes agency away from your target. Like a f***ing loopy it makes her. This is no different from slipping a mickey. Perhaps you'd like to tell Mr. Wang yourself. I don't care if this pheromone is extracted and bottled from the sweat glands of Henry Cavill, Jason Momoa, and Hugh Jackman themselves. Whispering wang into your lover's ear will always kill the mood. Trust me. Louis Lindell, Federal Bureau of Investigation. So when Danny said, All right, the Bureau's in the house. If they move towards Blackjack, somebody tip Livingston. I think it's safe to interpret that as tip him off before they are breathing down his f***ing neck. Yes, I know this ultimately doesn't matter because Agent Caldwell is in on the heist, but in that case, why send out a warning at all? His fingerprints were all over that shuffling machine. Yes, sir. I need a name and all known criminal associates. Let's talk about the villain's lack of a plan, because I'm beginning to suspect Bank is feeling guilty and wants Danny to pull this off. He's had six months to dig into that government database and find out everything he needs to know about Danny. 
just on the off chance that he pulls a revenge heist at some point in the future. Okay, maybe he was preoccupied building his casino, but how about running it the second Danny shows up and steals all of the high rollers? Again, just in case it's part of a bigger plan, which of course it is. My God, if Bank had thought of this even 12 hours ago, he could have plugged their faces into Greco and shut this shit down before it even began. Why is Basher doing whatever he's doing with his laptop in this very public restaurant, as opposed to the privacy of the room they're staying in? It doesn't seem at all necessary for him to be out in the open like this. What do we have in place for this? Nothing. They'll scoop us all up and Bank will have the best night of his life. How do you have nothing in place for this? How did nobody conceive of this possibility? The manufactured tension in this film is infuriating. Just had to make a last minute pickup. At this point, they may as well tell Bank what they're doing, because he obviously doesn't get a rat's ass. I get hiding in plain sight, but parading the recently recovered Reuben around is as subtle as a prosthetic nose. There's no way Reuben would want anything to do with the casino Bank stole from him unless it was because something revengey was going down. Wow. Uh -huh. Stunning. Another huge leap here. He gets her all horned up and tells her he can't f her and his boss is sweet and does she know any place inside this massive structure they could go to be private and have sex and he just knows she will choose the room where the diamonds are and he's right. Send that to Banks' office. Or you could call him and tell him this crucial information. You know, just in case he doesn't happen to be staring at his computer or is currently being distracted by discount evil can evil. Basher has to literally impersonate the bike jump guy to distract Bank from his computer while these f twits hack it to change the names and sh**. And they still spent five minutes f**king with David Paymer at his door for jokes. They could be done with this already. Yes, if your audience wants to see a bunch of long hairs riding rice rockets. Definitely racist. Thank you. Yeah, I'm looking. Does Virgil's tampering affect the files in the Greco room as well? If it does, then surely someone down there is watching them change in real time. We'll know something shady is happening and alert Bank. If it's just Bank's version that's affected, then all the names will still be the same on the original version, but are apparently never mentioned on his follow-up phone call. Genuine shock, genuine surprise, pupil dilation, elevated heartbeat. See, this is why it's possible to overtrust computers. They went so hard after human biological measurements, they forgot to use standard video surveillance to see Rusty at that slot just before it won. Dumbasses. Synchronizing watches. Pulling down levers. Pushing a random button. Excitement? You get reception in here? That's impossible. Not with this phone. Magnetron. Who's got a magnetron? If they managed to get a magnetron to fit inside a phone on this short notice, why did f***ing Roman make out like this sh was impossible? The damn thing didn't even need to be with Bank. Surely they could have bribed one of these Greco lackeys to take it in with them and turn it on at an agreed time. Better than relying on the digger for this and the exit plan. When the system senses a threat, it shuts down and reboots. But the games kept going? And this is a state-of-the-art system? Isn't it supposed to spot threats so they can be stopped? And not itself stop when a threat arises? This shit is f***ing stupid. It's not artificial intelligence, it's artificial stupidity. Well, for how long? Three minutes and 20 seconds. We will now cut to a montage of the casino losing money hand over fist for the duration of the system's downtime. But I repeat that the system shutting down because it sensed a threat is a top 10 stupid ass movie plot point. God damn, this makes me angry. It can read people's blood pressure and heart rate and it's designed to stop cheating, but the second it senses a threat, which is so vague here it means nothing to nobody, it shuts down for three minutes without also shutting down the casino games. <laughs> I'm 20 sinning this bullshit. We are never told exactly how this lighter and dice combination is supposed to work, so naturally I did some research. In short, unless the film's working title was Ocean's 13, a Star Wars story, it f***ing doesn't. And even if the magic dust Virgil sprinkled into the dice mix did somehow give them limited control, how are they supposed to get the dice to land on the number they want with just one flick? Also, these two dice take an eternity to make their final landing. How the f*** did nobody notice this sudden appearance of cubular free will? Here, have some unnecessary neon numbers to indicate everyone is winning, just in case you were confusing the cheering and fist pumping for defeat. Also, how are they managing to rig every single table? Danny and Rusty seem to be looking after one craps table between them, and Frank has the dominoes, but apparently every table in the casino is winning. I don't think they even needed Greco to shut down. There's diddly sh** Bank can do if everyone starts winning simultaneously. Shut her down! She is shut down. Did their fake earthquake cause the real earthquake? Or is the movie saying it really is a coincidence? The earthquake's over! They're getting it back! They're getting it back in! There's really no reason for Bank to be concerned here. The point of this exit plan was to get everyone out of the casino so they wouldn't continue betting and inevitably lose everything they just want. But there's no way all these people had time to cash in their chips and collect their winnings when the earthquake hit. They have to go back inside to cash their chips. Glad to see old everyone gets arrested, but they weren't actually arrested fake out has made a return. 
I reckon we've got about three more movies before that starts getting old. This must be the most unnecessarily elaborate camouflage to have ever camouflaged. And what the f*** use is it when you're not standing up against a wall of red and yellow stained glass? <laughs> so all that, anything above five inches being a deal breaker bullsh** was, well, bullsh**. Vincent Cassell does to the fake diamonds what I'd like to do to this entire movie. While it makes for a fun final series of shots, does the gang really need to gather at a prominent Vegas tourist spot after every major Vegas heist? Doesn't this just increase their chances of being seen together? What part of the con artist's handbook tells you to spend excessive time gloating over your recent win before moving on? Don't you want as much distance between you and your last crime as possible? You think this is funny? Well, Terry, it sure as shit ain't sad. F yeah, goddammit, Clooney, take me now. Wearing sunglasses indoors. I won $11 million! The fact that you can win $11 million at slots at the Vegas goddamn airport. Yoink!